Thank you, Luca, for those inspiring words, as ever. And thank you also for the ECBC's continued support of this event, along with the EBRD. Like Luca, I'm going to um, regret that we're not all in Vienna having this conference in person. We've been running this covered on briefing as part of the CE conference for several years, and now the second year that we're doing it in a virtual format, hopefully the last year. Um, we fully intend to be back in Vienna, both for the CEE conference um, in the spring at some stage, and for the Covered Bond conference in September. So um, fingers crossed for that. A very happy new year to you as well. Um, it's good to see so many of you are attending this event. Now, Lucas spoke uh, briefly there about the volumes that we've already seen. Um, we've already seen in terms of issuance this year. I think I think so far nothing from the CE region. Um, and he spoke about the tiramisu and the schnitzel that the directive is providing. Well, hopefully we'll be able to provide some matia and some pierogi from, from this region. Now, the big question of how many bonds we're going to have is going to be a key one, but also what they're going to look like post-directive and what their value is. These are the questions that I'm going to be asking my panel in the first um, in the course of the next hour. After that, after a short break, we're going to be talking about green covered bonds with, with a, a different panel. We're going to be talking about the prospects for the development there, which I think we'll all agree are very, very positive. Let me briefly introduce the panel that you see in front of you today. Uh, we have two representatives of issuers. Sergio Prescu from Alpha Bank Romania is um, the, the, the founder, I suppose, of the Romanian covered bond market, the issuer of the first covered bond there. But he also has a wider responsibility as a member of the executive committee of the European Mortgage Federation and as general manager of the international network at Alpha Bank Group. Similarly, with a broad issuance responsibility, Nicola Garandino, the head of ALM for this region at Unicredit. Nicola has responsibility for, I think, the issuance of all of the banks in the CE and Eastern European region and appetite, hopefully, to do many covered bonds in many different jurisdictions. Helping that happen is Jacek Kubas of the EBRD. Jacek, I'm sure everyone knows, has been a champion of the covered bond market in this region for, for many years now, working on developments in too many countries to, um, to count and to list, but as a great <laughs> champion of the, the asset class. Uh, Matthias Melms from Helleba. Matthias is the head of the DCM and syndicate uh, syndicate desk there. And keeping us all in check, Jane Soldera from Moody's. Jane being responsible for the legal frameworks, the regulations, the methodologies, and many other things bes besides at Moody's. Thank, thank you all for joining us today. Um, can I start then, Matthias, just by asking you about volumes. Now, what's going to be driving the volumes? Um, you know, we, we know that we haven't seen many bonds. We're hopeful to see many bonds this year. Um, is it the central banks? Is it other factors? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, first of all, warm welcome from Frankfurt and a happy new year to you all. Uh, unfortunately, I can't provide tiramisu or paella from Frankfurt, but also green sauce. But nevertheless, as we also have the ECB here, uh, where I can, can talk a lot about what is driving uh, covered bond volumes in 2022. So first of all, we have to talk about the past, the last two years that were influenced definitely and uh, overall from uh, the, the COVID crisis and the response of the central bank, especially the ECB on that. And um, at least in the Eurozone, but also in um, other regions and then countries in the world, the central banks uh, stepped in and uh, supported the banks and uh, directly and, and of course indirectly uh, the real economy to survive this, this deeply crisis that is uh, still happened. Saying that um, Corona is still there, uh, central banks not so much anymore. So um, with all the central bank support that started in March 2020, um, over the last 18 months, uh, central banks have stepped back uh, at, at least in some jurisdictions uh, much more than in other jurisdictions. But uh, even the ECB is not as active as they were in the last 18 months anymore in the Eurozone. 
Um, as the issuance volume of covered bonds were highly influenced, especially by the TLTO programs, and when we look at uh, the numbers um, of the retained covered bonds that were used as um, securities uh, at the ECB, we can see that the volume nearly doubled from 400 billion to close to 800 billion um, by end of 2021. So we have seen a lot of issuance activity taking place um, there, but it was mostly retained. And when we look at the single jurisdictions, um, we can see that uh, because of, of the measurements of the different central banks, not only the ECB, but also the, the domestic central bank, for example, in, in Poland, the share of retained issues were, uh, issuance was, was nearly 100%. When I look, for example, as we are in the CE region, when I look at Poland, uh, we have seen uh, retained covered bonds with a share of 100% of, of all issuance activity, but also uh, in Estonia, um, where we, we have had the support, of course, of the ECB, uh, issues use the opportunity and uh, retained nearly 70%. On the other hand, where uh, central banks weren't as active as uh, in the Eurozone, for example, in the Czech Republic, uh, the uh, percentage of retained issues were on extremely low levels. So we can see a different reaction um, on the central bank with different uh, influence of the funding activities uh, from the, the covered bond issues, where we've had programs in place um, where the banks have had access to central bank lending and uh, especially programs as a response of the corona crisis. Uh, issued make heavily use of it and use as a, a collateral use covered bonds. Well, we haven't seen that. Uh, issues were still active in that market, um, were still active in that market and, and were issuing in the broader market as the overall covered bond markets in different currencies, not only in zeros, but also in domestic currency, were open nearly during the whole crisis with the exception of the beginning of the crisis in March at the beginning of April. But uh, fingers crossed and knock on woods, uh, even this crisis proved that it was possible for the issuers uh, to fund themselves via covered bond issuance, not only with the central bank, but um, also with um, the wholesale market. So, and then that was overall a, a good and again, uh, very, very uh, helpful proof for the product covered bond and the resilience even during the deep crisis. And again, after, um, the GFC and now the Corona crisis, the product has proven that is uh, exactly there when you need it is, means during crisis you have excess with covered bonds uh, and you get liquidity with covered bonds. And a little, looking a little bit ahead, at the beginning of the year, have we, un, we haven't reached two full weeks, but what we so far see is having issuance activity, especially but not only uh, in, in the euro markets. Unfortunately, not yet from a CE issue, but I'm completely convinced that we will also see CE issues coming to the markets in the coming week and months. The market is there. The market is, is broadly opened, especially maturities up to 10 years. And um, as the central banks step back with the support for the markets, uh, even the ECB, I think we will see uh, again a normalization of issuance activity uh, in, in 22, not only in Euro, but also in domestic currencies, as we have seen some still uh, some funding going on, for example, in the Nokia market these days. So they will get a normalization of the whole um, issuance situation. Thanks. So 800 billion of retained issuance and markets clearly wide open so the decision to do TLTRO or equivalents or cover bonds is purely down to a straight cost comparison for issuers? Yeah definitely at the moment we don't have any compare uh, um, offer from the from the central banks uh, as I mentioned uh, programs were not in place anymore or uh, we have the announcement that the programs will be reduced in the future 
So, and uh, so covered bond issuance is at the moment uh, the, the, the preferred decision by the issuers, I would say. Yeah. Well, that, that's the capital markets aspect of it. The other thing is, I suppose, the demand for funds from the banks. And here I'd like to turn to Nicola and Sergio. Um, one of the characteristics of the pandemic has been a big inflow of deposits in, in some countries. Um, is that what you've seen? Is it something that you really on do you see any people challenging you for the deposits how, how would you characterize that if i may please uh, richard first of all thank you for uh, for the invitation and happy new year to everyone uh, yes i think that is a, a very fair statement i mean we have seen um, in the first year of the pandemic uh, a significant inflow of deposits in most of the countries in the central and eastern uh, Europe. Uh, I mean, just to give some uh, some numbers, uh, Hungary, for example, the deposit grew by more than 23 uh, percent in 2020. Uh, Estonia by 19 percent. Uh, Romania by 12.5 percent, and so on and so forth. Uh, this has come to a certain, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, tempering in the second year, in uh, the second year of the pandemic in 2021, and uh, we have seen a reduction of this inflows of deposits. And right now, the growth rates of deposits in these countries they uh, uh, they have come to almost 50 percent or even 25 percent of the growth rates of the 2020. So uh, we see that uh, there is a certain normalization of this uh, uh, deposit uh, growth rates in the countries. Uh, but what has happened at the same time, and this is something that we may pay attention to, is that uh, due to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, high inflationary environment in the 2021 in uh, most of these countries, whether they are in Eurozone or not, uh, we uh, started to see that, you know, uh, uh, the mismatch of maturity starts to become much more important in the analysis of, uh, uh, of the bank. So, you know, we may even if the loan to deposit ratio uh, in most of these countries they are at very uh, low levels in the sense that you know we have a an average of around 0 0.7 0 0.75 across the uh, geography that i was referring to earlier uh, despite this kind of low level of loan to deposit ratio the fact that there is an increasing mismatch of maturities it may create the the auspices for uh, for a good uh, year in terms of issuances of uh, cover bonds in uh, in most of these countries and you know just to uh, just to refer to what matthias was saying earlier i think that uh, he has anchored the the opening uh, discussion uh, very very well uh, around the role that the central banks may play in this market and uh, you know at the end of the day it comes it comes down to whether the central banks uh, banks want to play in a much more active way the cover bond market or uh, uh, or not. And we have uh, here uh, examples of central banks where uh, they are becoming much more involved in the sense in the sense of uh, you know uh, participating actively in uh, uh, purchases of cover bonds or participating in uh, imposing certain. Uh, levels of uh, funding of the mortgage portfolio with uh, uh, cover bond uh, issuances whereas other uh, central banks they are lagging behind from uh, from that point of view thank you and, and nicola same question for you really are you seeing similar levels of deposit growth similar um, concerns about asset liability mismatches as a driver and i suppose related question what about the non-eurozone central bank facilities so they you know, we talk a lot about the TLTRO winding off. What about the other um, the other central bank facilities in your countries of operation? Yeah, I mean, in relation to the first point, I have to say that uh, um, um, I agree with what uh, Sir just stated. Uh, we saw a huge uh, increase of deposits both in uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, let's see, uh, in 2020, it was also driven by the fact that, you know, our banks were seeking more liquidity in order to uh, offset potential effects of the uh, of the financial crisis. In reality, you know, we ended up the, the, the year with a lot of liquidity and higher liquidity, much higher than uh, the, the, the begin of the of the pandemic. Um, we so continued uh, 
collection of deposit uh, uh, throughout 21. This is also due to the fact that there is a you know, lack of, of, uh, of uh, alternatives in many countries where we have either negative rates or in any way very low, uh, very low rates. Uh, and similarly, uh, there was for some cases also a perception of a uh, you know risk uh, in in the in the uh, retail. Uh, so there was a kind of flight to to to, to quality and uh, uh, banks, which are you know leading or are have an important uh, credit standing in the respective countries, were obviously collecting a lot of uh, of money. Um, we are trying obviously to. Uh, reduce this uh, uh, this uh, this liquidity uh, with commercial actions. We hope uh, we will be able to have a, a, a expansion of loans. Uh, so we do expect a, a, a material uh, loan growth over the, the next few years. And uh, um, similarly, uh, I mean, we also in relation to, to the other point you, you mentioned before, we believe that uh, while Deposit collection is important in terms of cash and liquidity. Still, we need to look also at, uh, let's say, structural liquidity. So, in that respect, mm -hmm. the usage of, of cover bonds is is an essential tool. We see in our banks uh, in the in the region, uh, cover bond together with the, let's say the the uh, financial instrument provided by by supranational as the the core uh, funding tool core financial tools so away from the commercial angle. Um, therefore, we do expect to have a, a significant amount of uh, uh, issuances in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the region as far as the Central Europe is, is concerned. Obviously, in the Eastern Europe, so countries like, uh, like Croatia, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, obviously, we have, uh, let's say, there is also the need of further legislative developments in order to to uh, to let the market grow mm. uh, in relation to the central bank support outside the eu obviously i mean the uh, size the the entity of the the, the uh, intervention cannot be comparable to the to, to the ecb of course on the other end uh, um and to say that there were important uh, important uh, um, support from from the central bank, uh, either through supporting uh, repo transactions, generally on the govis rather than uh, other assets, uh, or also with FX operations. Uh, in Hungary, worth to mention, uh, um, let's say very important activity by the local central bank last year, uh, which supported the. the um, you know, a lot of the bank's liquidity position, and also into the, to 2021, there were also a, um, a cover bond purchase program that supported the, uh, the issuances. Actually, as in the Credit Hungary, we took part of the program, so we also issued a, a cover bond with a, let's say, green flag, mm -hmm. uh, which is worth to to, uh, to mention. So obviously, the let's say the degree of the intervention of the central banks in in C. Uh, was lower, but still, uh, let's say, important. Uh, and uh, as also Sergio said, uh, and, and Matthias as well, I believe that the role of central banks also in supporting the um, uh, the core bond liquidity, not only in the primary market, but also in the secondary as well as in the repo operations is uh, is, uh, is is crucial for further development of, uh, of the instrument in the region. Mm. Nicola and Sergio call it supporting the market. Mateus, you presumably consider it nationalizing your business. Um, when you hear these comments about the levels of deposits and the level of funding, what's your what's your comment? And, and can I do a follow on question? Let's do two questions at, at the same time. What about um, the underlying asset growth in particular as we're talking about mortgages? You know, we all hear these horror stories about house prices going crazy. Are you hearing a lot of about asset, asset to growth? You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, pardon. Uh, let me unpin that what uh, Nicola and Sergio just mentioned. We have seen massively heavily inflow as response from consumers uh, to this corona crisis in in deposits uh, in the single jurisdictions and this massively inflows were taking away at least some 
of the issuance activity besides uh, the opportunities that the central banks grant um, for the issuers. Uh, but, but overall, what we, from our perspective uh, here is what we really think what could happen in the, in the coming months when the crisis hopefully is coming down um we, we believe also on the other hand uh, a heavily outflow out of this deposit and i don't think that these deposits are still there to fund uh, the, the increasing demand uh, for mortgages when i look at the overall figures from from the grow to the growth of the mortgage stock in uh, in ce region um, just pick out some some figures I have collected there so far. For example, in in Hungary, um, the mortgage stock grew last year by uh, somewhere around seven to eight percent. In in Romania, we have seen a heavily growth, uh, somewhere around nine, ten, ten percent. When you look at Czech Republic or, or Poland, uh, the, the the figures are nearly everywhere similar, and it's not only a CE topic uh, of all we have to underpin that. Um, it's, it's a topic that we see nearly everywhere, uh, at least in the developing countries, uh, not only Europe, but also in, in North America uh, or somewhere else. Uh, so uh, a, a, a flight to housing, uh, overall a fear of the people uh, for inflation and uh, with, with this uh, at the demand for housing that is not new overall, but uh, overall, uh, my impression is that that ha speed has accelerated, and I'm pretty convinced that we are not able to um, refinance these growing demand for mortgages with uh, only de deposits overall. Saying that, on the other hand, with, with my assumption that we will see an outflow uh, over the coming months, where the coming down um, of the pandemic, there is definitely a heavily need to, to find other refinancing sources for this mortgages and the response from my perspective at least uh, can only be where possible issuing covered bonds so that that whole development will uh, support covered bond issuance acti activities for, from both legs outflows or deposit on the one hand on the other hand uh, increasing uh, or the further increasing demand for mortgages one small comment from my side, Richard, if I may, it's uh, uh, with regards to the second question uh, regarding the high level of uh, deposits. We should not forget that in 2020 and frankly speaking, uh, uh, well into 2021, we also had the moratoria period. So uh, the moratoria per se, they have taken a toll on the liquidity of the bank. So, you know, most of the banks, they were uh, 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 rushing in in order to gather deposits during that period of time because that would have uh, offset or compensated the uh, the uh you know lack of liquidity that otherwise would have uh, arise from the implementation of this moratoria so we need to we need to keep that in mind as well so we we may have to adjust for that because it was a particular year yeah um and, and yeah check what what are your thoughts on the house price growth and the expansion Absolutely. i just wanted to add uh in that regards uh so obviously there are so many factors that we see in terms of the house prices and mortgage market, especially in Central Eastern Europe, which is still quite young. And if you see the mortgage penetration by, by the market, so different to more advanced economies. But what we see indeed, the house prices are really uh, increasing uh, quite a lot. Uh, and there is also an increased demand, but we will have to think also about other factors that at the moment we are looking at. Firstly, the inflation element, which is growing. So people are trying to find the the right ways of uh, parking their money in relevant assets, which would allow them to grow. So that's one of the elements where we see investors, individuals putting savings into the real estate even more than than that was done in the uh, in the past. Uh, we also see the interest rate um, rising in the by the central bank in those uh, countries in Central Eastern Europe. So again, may some people may think about still jumping on this and obtaining a mortgage. Uh, sooner than later and fixing it to the considerable amount of time. That also brings cover bonds as a good instrument to um, uh, to use for funding. But on the other hand, we have also a big increase in terms of the cost of uh, energy products, right? In terms of gas and electricity, which to an extent 
may impact certain buyers in terms of the decision that they will be making, looking maybe for more energy efficient homes uh, and therefore going more also towards the green cover bond market uh, developing there. So I really think it is uh, it is different and I just can tell you personally, uh, I'm about to sell one of my properties in Poland and uh, I bought it seven years ago and I'm about to sell it at the three times the price I bought it. So you can see what really in, uh, in has happened in the last seven years in the real estate market. So if anybody wants to buy a flat in Warsaw, please get in touch with Jacek afterwards. Um, I'd like to get on to the implementation of the directive. Before I ask uh, Jane about that, though, one thing I should have said at the beginning, um, any questions for the audience, please pop them in the chat room and they will be, be um, sent over to us. We're very happy to get any kind of questions. Um, let's move on to the, the directive. Jane, um, I, think, I think Luca briefly in his introductory remarks spoke about um, you know, the fact that not that many countries have actually implemented the directive. Um, is that a concern for you? Which countries are you are you focusing on at the moment? And related question, the directive had lots of areas for interpretation. Are you seeing much difference in the way that different countries in the region are implementing? Thanks, Richard. Uh, I would probably have to send you back to Luca for the, um, the, the most accurate rundown on, on who has and hasn't uh, implemented. Um, from this CEE uh, side of things, as far as I'm aware, it's been, the directive's been fully implemented by Estonia, Latvia, Hungary, Slovakia and Slovenia. Uh, there is a draft that we have seen uh, from Bulgaria, Czech Republic and Poland. I haven't seen drafts from Croatia, Lithuania and Romania. They may well be out there. Um, and also it is noteworthy that for a number of these countries, this is a new uh, project. So uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Lithuania, I think, and Slovenia um, are um, either replacing very old unused laws or, or producing cover bond frameworks for the first time. And it's clear uh, in this process that there has been a fair amount of coordination, a fair amount of assistance given across, across Europe. And so these new laws that are being produced are by and large of a, of a really pretty, pretty good standard and a pretty state of the art sort of, sort of quality um, from a credit perspective. Um, in terms of these national descriptions, um, or perhaps just also to say what, 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 what are we focusing on? I think the um, everything is the answer. Um, primarily jurisdictions where we have ratings outstanding. Also um, on the timing, the um, not a huge concern from, from our perspective. I think it's probably more of a concern for issuers who risk losing their um, cross-border preferential treatment under CRR if they uh, can't comply with the uh, requirements of Article 129 for their preferential treatment. That's likely to be a somewhat temporary phenomenon. It's not super credit sensitive because it's it's a sort of short term issue um, but clearly it has it has the the room to disrupt the market somewhat so i don't think that's a situation that anyone really um, it really hopes to see there are a few technical issues around that as well that that could could cause issues around um, uh, what the effect is domestically versus internationally and so on we, we, Looking we more at the, sorry. I was going to say we love the technical <laughs> issues. I was going to wonder if you're going to elaborate on which the, the, the more relevant ones are. Oh, well, there is one, um, for instance, if a bond is issued after July, I think it's July the 8th, uh, but before the directive is implemented, can that bond ever actually comply with Article 129? I think it's really not clear what the answer is there. Um, the, the, the um, yeah, that 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 was a bit of a grey area when we, we started to look at that. Uh, but the the credit impact of not being able to comply is is not 
perhaps um, the most um, concerning thing from the issuer's perspective. It's a commercial um, issue rather than a traffic <laughs> issue. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Um, on the discretions, the thing about the directive is that it's full of discretions and partly that's that's very much deliberate. It's it's about the the tiramisu, the national delicacies, not not breaking things that aren't broken. There are a number of complete areas that are completely discretionary. Will you or won't you have an external cover pool monitor? Will you or won't you have a cover pool administrator? And then within areas that are compulsory, there are big areas of discretion as well and some important areas. The one that we've really um, that many people uh, have been focused on is the question of liquidity. So the, um, there is compulsory liquidity in the directive, the six month liquidity buffer, where um, issuers need to hold um, the maximum uh, net shortfall in assets over the, the forthcoming 180 day period. Um, they need to hold that in, in very liquid assets. This, this can be um, this requirement can be removed effectively, um, well, to simplify slightly, if a country chooses to allow issuers to instead have maturity extensions, and we're normally talking here about a 12 month extension. And of course, extensions or soft bullet bonds are completely normal in the cover bond market. That's nothing radical, but um, that's the other big area of discretion um, that, that sort of is connected to this is this question of, countries now have to specifically regulate these extensions. So they have to say, can we have extensions? And if we can, what will the triggers be? So there's these two issues that are somewhat, um, I can, you could say credit sensitive in that they are regulating how much liquidity there is, how much of it's uh, ex ante in cash, mm -hmm. and what needs to happen for a cover bond to extend. Um, so, the question of extensions means that you've got three outcomes. One is hard bullet bonds, i.e. no extensions, but six months liquidity. Another is where you have both. So you have, say, a one year extension plus six months of liquidity. And the the big example there is, is the German framework, which has gone for that option. And then what, what we see in most of the rest of Europe is this um, soft bullets uh, without the liquidity without the principal liquidity they, they still have to hold interest for uh, interest liquidity mm. and that has been probably the dominant option across most european countries in the cee region it's a little bit more conservative um so perhaps the influence of the, the german influence a bit and also austria as far as we can tell has gone for the more conservative approach as well um so there are in, in Central and Eastern Europe, for instance, Slovakia has taken the option of having two one year extensions. Uh, that's quite quite a conservative approach. And in addition to that, also having the six month liquidity buffer and also Hungary, they're, they're, they've gone for both as well with a, a one off 12 month extension. So that is um, an area of optionality that's been really interesting and quite important. Uh, and the other one I would say is the maturity, the triggers for the mm. maturity extensions where there's been just a huge range of um, different options and different combinations of options, um, sort of a ranging from on the one hand, um, the uh, regulator or cover pool administrator has to decide and they can decide on very sort of wide grounds. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, just a, um, saying that it has to be objective and issuers can sort of decide what that means and it's sort of then no one gets to decide no third party is deciding so you've got this real range of options and, and all of them have pros and cons um, one thing that we have noticed and this is completely uh, predictable is that a lot of these extensions can take place if the issuers in resolution and that was kind of flagged in the drafting of the directive but um, if we think of these extensions uh, as being something that buys time for um, sorting out the cover bonds after the issuer goes bust, because before the issuer goes bankrupt, then the issuer is covering all the payments, um, then the, um, the prospect of extending in resolution where the issuer might 
just be like be restructured going concern it, it starts to be a bit of overlap and you start to slightly run the risk of front running in terms of when you're extending and and is it to help the issuer or is it to help the cover bonds um, so I would sort of highlight those areas one area where um, there was a lot of potential for quite um, damaging um, optionality is in the, the assets that can back cover bonds but in practice this really hasn't been taken up and that's been particularly um, I think supported by the fact that for pre preferential treatment under CRR um, that as the assets haven't been expanded at all. Mm. On, on those in particular the soft bullet and the liquidity points that you mentioned when national discretions are being used is, is that primarily a commercial thing of how useful the covered bond is for the issuer or are we talking notch rating notch sensitivity from a credit point of view? The extension from a credit point of view is... Well, well does this affect the, the, the credit ratings that are achievable or is this something which is purely a matter of the economics for the issuer? It will affect the credit analysis uh, to some extent depending on um, and the number of variables um, because uh, we look at how much time is available after um, issuer default to refinance the assets uh, to find a solution for um, the cover bonds that doesn't rely on the issuer and so um, whether that solution is a transfer um, some sort of bridge financing uh, what whatever solution is put in place um, a certain amount of time is needed ideally um, but you know a certain amount of time is needed the more time mm. you have the less pressure there is on refinancing but it's somewhat diminishing returns um, unless you have a complete pass through in which case you're sort of removing the risk completely uh, thank, thank you um, gotcha. Jane mentioned some of the, the new jurisdictions and the new laws be, being she was very favourable about them. Um, can you fill in the gaps in terms of the countries where we haven't spoken about in terms of where the progress of the law is? And also, we've had a very interesting question from the audience. Thank you, whoever asked that, saying that um, some countries in the region have had covered bond laws for years. Why haven't they been used before? Absolutely. And uh, I wouldn't be able to represent EBRD if I uh, would not talk about the work that we are actually doing across Central Eastern Europe to pro and beyond now to promote this uh, asset class and how much time and effort so many people in the organization and big thanks to them are actually spending in, in championing uh, cover bonds. And uh, I, it's very great to hear from uh, Jane and uh, Moody's about a uh, positive look at those um, legislation. Uh, I wanted to give shout out to a couple of countries that uh, and bring their attention that we've achieved the progress and then where we are also working uh, a lot uh, in order to, to, to achieve the progress um, as well. So one element uh, is really Estonia, which I'm very happy that the legislation has been amended there because it is important for a number of reasons. First, it aligned the law that was adopted initially to the cover bond um, directive. But secondly, to really give more life to the pan-Baltic cover bond vision that we've been working on on the legal regulatory framework for quite some time. Uh, similarly to Latvia, which adopted the law and uh, is in line with the directive. So we already have across the Baltic states, two countries, Estonia and Latvia, that uh, have those legis this legislations in place. The issue is uh, in uh, Lithuania, where we are still working on the legislation which is finalized and we are waiting for the authorities including the ministry to submit the law to the parliament there were so many priorities uh, in relation to the pandemic and economic recovery that slightly put cover bond on the back burner but i really hope that 2022 is a year where those elements could um, uh, change and to other jurisdictions because i know we're running out of time that i wanted to to, to bring as an example is um, Bulgaria and Croatia. We've worked in Bulgaria on cover bond law a uh, whole last year and achieved a great result. And the law is to be submitted to the parliament. It took a little bit longer than expected in the last months because 
we had quite an uncertain political um, uh, elements in Bulgaria because there was no permanent government that was just recently uh, established. Uh, so I hope that that stability angle that was brought and addressing the major priorities will then also lead to the adoption of the cover bond law in Bulgaria uh, this year. And similarly to, to Croatia, where the working group uh, really started working up to speed and uh, last year, and we have the draft law that is ready to be submitted to the parliament that doesn't need any more consultations or edits, which I'm very happy that uh, this is happening. And then in terms of the question why we have countries where it took a while to, to have cover bonds issued. I mean, I think Sergio will be great to comment on that because Romania was one of them where we adopted the, the law and then we waited for quite some time uh, to, to have the first um, issuance coming to the market. And that was for a number of reasons, including the banks being funded by deposits and actually cover bonds seemed for them to be a bit more expensive way of uh, obtaining funding and uh, not looking at it, I, I would say, so much long term, maybe the current economic circumstances will be changing. The other element which we saw that impacted a lot cover bond issuance in Central Eastern Europe is the regulatory capital and MREL uh, issuances, which are happening all over uh, all over Central Eastern Europe, uh, especially we saw it last uh, year. And the question is, to what extent if you have a bank that is issuing already 500 million euro uh, MREL or regulatory capital related instrument, what appetite is to go for another benchmark of cover bond and not only appetite, but need on the funding side? Um, I think, thank, thank you for that. I think both, both Nicola and Sergio, uh, if you could answer that comment on, on the... Yeah. I mean, I existing. cannot refer to, to experiences in other geographies, but definitely I can refer to the experience in Romania because to a certain extent I was, uh, I was living it and driving it. At the same time so uh yes i think that you know uh, there are uh, uh, some impediments in the initial uh, format of the law that uh, uh, has been passed in 2005 year if i remember correctly so you know in romania for example used to have a covered bond law that uh, was uh, passed in 2005 or 2006 and then nothing has happened until 2018 when we have issued the first uh, 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 covered bond issues in uh, in Romania, uh, but in order to do so, we needed to change the law. So it was a long, long process uh, by which we had to engage with all the stakeholders and all the the uh, parties that were taking uh, uh, a certain view in uh, in the process, including the central bank and uh, uh, you know the the political spectrum, in order to be able to make the law uh, much more uh, welcoming to uh, and much more updated to the current reality of, a cover, of the cover bond market. So uh, it took us a lot of time, but once we have managed to do that, and you know, at this moment we do have a law which, and by the way, Jane, just to answer to your question, there is a draft law in Romania and uh, it is in public uh, discussion for the time being. We are going back and forth in uh, uh, discussing this draft law with uh, with the Romanian uh, Central Bank and other uh, uh, parties, uh, we uh, hope that uh, you know uh, this is going to uh, to come very close to the uh, uh, and actually is going to transpose the directive in a very uh, accurate way at this moment. We still have some uh, pain points that we are discussing. Uh, uh, internally, as to the question of uh, why we haven't been able to to issue, uh, it was definitely the problem of uh, uh, you know the loan to deposit ratio, which is quite uh, quite low in uh, Romania, and therefore there was no need at this uh, at this moment uh, from the other banks in the local market to uh, seek alternative sources of funding. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this may change because, as I was saying at the beginning of uh, uh, the session. I think that the mismatch of maturities is going to become much more important in the analysis of the in the risk analysis of the banks uh, going forward. So uh, this is a you know a, a good way to fund your mortgage uh, portfolio. And by the way, the fact that you know we have at the level of the European Union uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, we have only uh, uh, you know. Uh, Roughly, although we have 5% of the total mortgage portfolio of the European Union in Central and Eastern Europe, we have only 2.4, 2.5% of the covered bonds of the central of the of the uh, uh, EU at this moment, which shows that there is a huge potential going forward 
for the countries in Central and Eastern Europe in order to fund their mortgage portfolios via covered bonds. Okay. And then, <laughs> please. Yeah, uh, just just adding on uh, on the same topic. Uh, I would say that despite the fact that in uh, in a few countries we had uh, uh, let's say a framework in place, then it's not only a matter of you know the framework itself, but it depends also um, as already commented on the need of liquidity of structured liquidity for the specific uh, banks in the, in the, in those countries. Uh, and uh, um, let's say we have two uh, big uh, other let's say com competitors uh, uh, to the cover bond which are the um, funding provided by the supranational agencies which mm -hmm. is you know in some cases very very cheap and you know in some cases it can be also comparable in terms of uh, of, uh, of purposes especially if you talk about all the lines which are somehow green and um, you know dedicated to, to social purposes etc um, on the other end um, also, uh, the uh, M relations, which is making, as as just stated, uh, um, you know, an important uh, uh, source of structural funding for 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 the banks. So the cover bond becomes, you know, more an opportunistic uh, um, uh, source in certain cases. Uh, uh, on top of that, uh, it's also you know, important to, to highlight that you need uh, an investor base, especially if you want to target uh, a euro issues outside the country. Obviously, um, you know, local perception uh, of uh, of a risk of, uh, of an issuer is uh, pretty different uh, from the perception that an abroad investor might have. Uh, you have to take into account, you know, country risk, you have to take into account uh, liquidity risk. So uh, let's say, we have to put together the presence of a framework with the need of with the funding needs of, of the banks and uh, the the degree uh, of the um, investor base. There are a lot of topics there that I'd like to follow up on. Sadly, we don't have time to do that. We have time for one very very brief final question, and I'm going to ask all of you just um, if you can keep it to one sentence answer if you can. Five years from now, when we're in Vienna for the 2027 covered bond briefing. What's the Central and Eastern European covered bond market going to look like? Who wants to go first? So maybe if I can start uh, just one sentence. Uh, bright benchmark issuance activity in both uh, domestic and, and euro currency from all, all countries where we've seen covered bonds uh, laws yet. I love your optimism. Jane, do you want to go next? You're on mute. I would say the process of integration across Europe to to really standardise, increasingly standardise and um, support the importance of the cover bond product will, will continue and that CE countries will, will be part of that. OK. Nicola? Yeah, I'm also pretty optimistic and um, uh, true, there is a matter I believe that uh, generally all the funding and also the core bond funding will, will benefit uh, from, uh, from uh, let's say, DSG um, umbrella and therefore I expect uh, uh, volumes to, uh, to grow materially across the next five years. Sergio, are you going to be similarly upbeat? Yeah, I, I see. I see growth uh, in all the region. I think that, you know, the, the target of, uh, for the period is going to be close to double digits, but not double digits. But uh, I think that is going to, we are going to witness growth uh, in the cover bond area in, in the market. Right. And Jacek, you're never pessimistic. Never no, pessimistic. I'll make three predictions. Firstly, okay. more uh, 500 million uh, euro benchmark issuances, which maybe in five years time could be called a sub benchmark. We never know how the market will develop. And then majority of that, at least 90% in green. And then finally, uh, something that is going to be close to my heart because I'm starting a new a new job at the bank as the head of digital as of 1st of January. I hope we're going to have much more digital world and much more digital in the cover bond market, uh, including on the on the issuance side. I'm loving all of this optimism here and all through the panel. I think prospects are bright for, for issuance and for 
mark market coming to to realize its potential on the back of this directive thank you so much to all of my panelists for what's been an incredibly quick panel it's gone by it's gone by very quickly um i'm sorry that we couldn't spend more time talking about it